Hi everybody, welcome back to the Duma Podcast. The apologies are in order, of course, because of the slight delay in uploads. As you can see, I'm back in my hometown of Penang, where it is the long weekend and therefore the public holiday and therefore the inertia, so apologies for that. I'd like now to introduce my next guest. His name is Roman Bose. He's a Singaporean with deep Malaysian roots who now lives in the UK. Now, his working life closely resembles mine in that we both work for the foreign media. He covered politics and current affairs with Al Jazeera and AFP, amongst other establishments, whereas I covered financial markets for Bloomberg and Reuters. So, of course, as a fellow journalist, I was quite interested when his agent in Malaysia uh, got in touch with me some weeks ago to promote his new book called Shattered Hopes, which covered uh, Pakatan Harapan's rocky 22 months in power when they first came and won the election some years ago. I decided to not talk to Roman about the book because he has extensively covered his book with other podcasts and other establishments. I decided instead to, to, to discuss with him his decision to, to emigrate to the UK. Because it is a route that many Malaysians have taken through the years, because of all the corruption, all the injustices, all the imbalances that have taken place and the post us people um, through their years in power. I think there's a conversation that is worth taking place because many people seem to think that moving to places like the UK, Australia, Canada and Australia is of course better than it is in Malaysia. The, the whole idea of being the grass being greener on the other side is not new. But I also think that those Western countries is a very, very different place than what it was in the 90s and the noughties. And therefore, it was, it was with that in mind that I wanted to talk to Roman about what it's really like and whether the grass really is greener on the other side. So I'll let you make up your mind about whether that is true or not. Before we begin, as always, a little play to subscribe to the Do More podcast. The vast majority of people who watch the content on my channel are not subscribers. And if you can, please do, if you can, take the little step forward and subscribe to the channel because it is my aim, my ambition, to be able to speak to as many people in the region, not just in Malaysia, because I do believe that it is Asia's time of the century, uh, led, of course, by China and India. But Southeast Asia is just as important a region in terms of pushing the envelope and in terms of making ourselves heard on the world stage. And so now, without further ado, may I present, dear viewers, Roman Bos. You're the man. <laughs> Congratulations, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm in Malaysia, you're in the UK, London specifically, I think. Uh, congratulations, uh, your book has made it to number one on the MPH uh, bestseller list. Um, I guess let's just talk a little bit about the response to the book before we get into the uh, nitty-gritty uh, of the discussion, uh, Roman. Um, quite a lot of response. Even the politicians in question uh, talked to you, I think. Um, what happened there? Well, you know, I think it's, it's um, as you can tell, it's a very visceral book. I mean, it deals with what happened, you know, between 2018 and 2020. And I think for a lot of people, what occurred during that period remains still shrouded in mystery. So for, for many people, they knew, they know what happened. There was a change in government. How did that happen? Why did that, ha that happen? And more importantly, I think it was a sense of betrayal. A lot of people felt completely let down. They had voted in one government, and within 22 months, that government completely dissolved. Um, you know, their hopes for reform, their hopes for equality, their hopes for change, all of that was placed on this new government. They believed in the promises. They believed, um, you know, that these people would deliver. But what happened then in 22 months? How come, you know, they got the mandate, they received the support of the people, and yet within 22 months, the entire thing collapsed. I think that's, that's what many people are still wondering about, you know, and I think this book helps answer that. It doesn't give all the answers, but I think it makes it quite clear what actually happened. Um, and it shows, you know, that effectively you had a movement, a movement for reform, a movement that was looking to make significant changes in the country. But unfortunately, this movement was hijacked um, by Mahathir. It was hijacked by, by the group of people who were in power previously, who had created the, the system that had existed for 61 years um, in, in this country. Um, and that ended up being the problem because it was, you know, more um, old wine um, in a new bottle. I mean, uh, it was new branding, but pretty much um, old wine. And, and once you end up being hijacked by something like that, there's very little um, that you can do. 
but people wanted an explanation. They want to understand what actually happened, what transpired. So I think that's what's gotten the book uh, a lot of response at the moment um, from, from, from lots of Malaysians. Yes, and Kenny, because you said that, in fact, Najib was the um, unwilling enemy. I mean, even, I would say the naive the naive mm -hmm. victim here, and you actually fall on his side, and you say that Mahathir was actually full of machinations. He actually never intended to del deliver on the reforms, and he actually wanted to get rid of his um, diversified uh, cabinet and replace them with ultranationals. I mean, that's incredible, because that makes him the ultimate chameleon. That's, and that, the, the word chameleon is a, is a polite word, lah. <laughs> I, I think I, I think you know I think you're you're one hundred percent correct. I mean, the level of Machiavellian uh, planning and strategy that went into this. Let's not forget Mahathir was prime minister for twenty two years. I mean, he is steeped in this kind of ruthless antics, the machinations that took place in the first twenty two years when he was prime minister. The number of deputy prime ministers he went through. Um, the 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 this dissolution of Amno, the creation of Amno Baru. All of that, you know, Mahathir was veteran uh, to that, you know, and the key planner behind all of that. So it actually doesn't come as much of a surprise that even within the first couple of days um, or even before the formation of PH 1.0, he was still looking at how to throw out um, the, his non-Malay partners and put in a, a government that would give him, um, you know, much greater support basically from the Malay heartland. Um, so, you know... Have, have you actually spent you know, a considerable amount of time in front of Mahathir? Or, or have, you, have you spoken to people who, has, who are close to him and have tried to kind of like make sense of the way this person thinks? Well, you know, obviously I've studied Mahathir for, for many, many years, even before, uh, you know, from, from school days, everyone knows, knew about Mahathir. It's what you read, read about in the papers and what have you. Um, when I landed in Malaysia and covered, started covering Malaysian politics, obviously Mahathir was always, you know, front and foremost in terms of um, stories happening in the country itself. So I knew, I knew a lot of his people. I still know a lot of his people, um, lots of individuals around him. And of course, I've studied very closely um, what Mahathir has done. And, and I must admit, he is a brilliant tactician, a brilliant strategist, um, you know, and basically the master of the art form of politics. He knows what to say to one audience, what to say to another audience, how to balance it, and how to get the support. He is a quintessential politician because when you meet Mahathir, you will see the, the, the confidence that he has, the vision that he has, um, the charisma to bring you on board. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, but that also makes him the best liar in the world, isn't it? Well, this is it. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, the best politicians very often end up being uh, the ones who can tell you the, you know, the most amount of mistruths, um, you know. But, but Mahathir himself, um, you know, is an amazing character because he is principled in the sense that he wants to achieve whatever he wants. So it's either his way or the highway. So there are no two ways um, about it as far as Mahathir is concerned. If this is how he wants it done, that is how it gets done. Um, and he's completely single-minded um, in doing it. And whoever is in his way will be removed in achieving uh, those aims. Um, how did you end up in the um, Najib political committee? Um, how were you selected? Um, and when you talk to Najib, right, he actually, he's actually the opposite of Mahathir. Right? He's almost like a child, isn't he? In the sense that that's how you portrayed him. Well, you know, I think Maha for, for Najib, the thing was, you know, similar to Pa'la um, and all the other leaders in Amno, everyone had deference for Mahathir. So he was always viewed as the mentor. He was viewed as the big man. So even when Mahathir came out and started attacking Najib, you know, I remember going up to Najib once and, once and saying, um, look, we have to take action. You know, we have to highlight these things that Mahathir is saying. You know, you should sue him for making these comments that he's making. And immediately Najib said, no, 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 we can't do that. Uh, you know, it's impossible. It's impossible because, you know, he was my mentor. You know, he was the one that gave us all these opportunities. And, you know, in Malay culture, it is, you know, it is frowned upon to attack your elders, to say negative things about your elders. Um, and, you know, and actually that's what happened to poor Pa'la. I mean, you know, his elegant silence, if you remember, you know, not attacking Mahathir, not going up against Mahathir is what ended up in, in Pa'la's defeat in the first place. 
So Najib very similarly was unwilling to go up against Mahathir, although it was clear that Mahathir was wrong. It was clear that Mahathir was moving to try and topple the government in any which way he could. Um, you know, that was what uh, Mahathir was attempting to do. The, the, the problem was that, you know, in Ad, when you look at, you know, Malay culture, you look Adat Istiadat, you look at the way um, they behave, the customs, um, it is just frowned upon. Uh, to take down your elders, to, 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 to attack your, your elders. And so that's fundamentally one of the main reasons why um, Mahathir was able to get such a strong leverage over all his uh, you know, uh, successes, as it were, and to be able to topple them. So we've had since Mahathir, um, how many, three, two? Prime Minister, I've lost count. I think we are number, number 10, right? <laughs> yes. And like... Yes. God knows, five or something in the last five years. Or <laughs> I mean, in your read of the situation, how badly has democracy been, you know, uh, assaulted in Malaysia? I think the fundamental issue about democracy in Malaysia is that um, it has been a very, very difficult ride because one singular old man has attempted to shape democracy in this country. And that, unfortunately... Um, is a shame because the the machinations that he used, the ruthlessness that he used to achieve his vision, not necessarily the vision of all Malaysians, not necessarily the visions of, of his successes, um, has ended up basically hampering democracy uh, in, in a country like Malaysia, um, attempting to topple governments. I mean, he toppled the government of Pa'ala. He toppled the government um, of Najib. Um, he attempted to topple uh, uh, Mayuddin Yassin, attempted to topple um, Ismail Sabri. Um, you know, this, this is not, um, you know, this is not politics um, that is inclusive. This is exclusive politics. You know, this is basically, I want to achieve this and it doesn't matter what any of you want. This is what um, I want and this is what I will get. Um, and, and he had, has the, 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 the ability, the influence to do that. Over 22 years, he, the, you know, the networks that he built throughout the entire power structure in Malaysia, and I'm not just talking the political power structure, but even in the civil service, um, you know, within the entire system, um, you know, the system of patronage, the system of, um, um, you know, basically um, listening um, or being beholden almost um, to a former prime minister. Um, as a result, whenever anything needed to be done, he wouldn't even have to say that things had to be done. These individuals who knew that they owed their positions to him would actually, would actually automatically do it, um, you know, would carry out his instructions. He wouldn't even have to make these, make these instructions. I mean, that's how, um, you know, hampered uh, the political system um, had become in Malaysia. Um, and even today, um, you know, we're still suffering from that. Um, because there are many individuals that he's put in key positions that remain in key positions um, and who are still um, influenced by him um, and will carry out basically um, you know, what they believe uh, are actions in the best interests um, um, of Mahathir. Well, intriguingly, Roman, um, well, you and I, 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 I'd like to say, we're, we're, we're from the same ilk, I think. Um, journalism, you know, foreign news wires, correspondents, um, you know, you I think you're Al Jazeera and a couple other things, right? Um, but then I think you're Singaporean, but you've got very close Malaysia links, clearly relatives and what have you. But now you find yourself in the UK, and I think you're one of the people we describe as having lost to to brain drain, you know, the talent drain, right? Um, to to the extent that we can even call journalists uh, intelligent people or brains, right? <laughs> Why, why did you do that? Did you think the grass would be greener in the UK? Because um, we've got this colonial mindset to some extent, don't we? Well, you know, um, yes, grass is all, the grass always appears greener. But what happened to me was in 2011, I was actually headhunted by a political risk consultancy here in the UK. Um, and my kids were getting off the age where, you know, we needed to decide what kind of an education system we wanted to, to put them in. So given that I, I was made a really, really good offer, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't refuse it. I had to you know, look at it and say, yeah, all right, you know, this looks good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to do it. But what was very interesting was at the, at the same time, um, you know, the offer was made. We packed up the entire house. We shipped everything uh, to the UK. 
Um, and then a couple of days before um, before traveling to the UK, I met up with Najib. Um, and it was basically a, a, a farewell call to say goodbye. Um, thank you very much for everything. Um, and that was the first time I actually had a very long conversation with Najib. Um, it was supposed to be a 15-minute courtesy call. Um, but at the meeting, I, I had just covered Bursay 1.0. I had seen what transpired. I had seen what the opposition had done, and I had seen the blatant abuse by the security services on the ground, the water cannoning, the tear gassing, um, what had actually transpired. Um, and at the meeting, I presented a paper to Najib. I gave him a, a, a two-page paper, and I told him, look, this is actually what happened. You can say the opposition were responsible, but the, the police, the riot police on the ground, were just as bad in terms of taking vicious action against the protesters. Uh, people who were not protesting were attacked. Um, you know, they were being dispersed in a very brutal manner and arrested. And Najib was very surprised. I mean, when he saw that, he said, really, did this? I said, yes, all of this transpired. You know, and I, I named names. I, I pointed out to individuals because everyone had name tags. I was on the ground. I saw them, um, these individuals. So he said, look, um, Roman, how about coming to work for me? I said, I'm sorry. I've, <laughs> I've just got a job in the UK. I'm, I'm, I'm headed there. Um, at which point he said, all right, never mind. You know, here's my, my, my phone number. Here, here's my email. Um, maybe you can message me with, with these things because, as he said, very often I'm not told about what completely happened on the ground. So, you know, what you're telling me actually is news to me because I did not realize um, that all of these things had actually transpired. And I believe that, you know, the, the problem very often with people in such positions of power is that you're surrounded by individuals who only want to give you good news. They don't want to give you the entire picture of what's going on. So it's very hard to assess what's actually happening um, on the ground itself. So over the next couple of months, um, I actually began providing him with, with, with details on what I saw was going on, you know, what the situation uh, was that was happening. Um, and more and more, um, he wanted me to advise him on the kind of actions um, that, that he should take. So from, from that start, uh, you know, um, it, it was, you know, an occasional phone call, maybe once or twice a week. It became almost a daily messaging uh, of each other, at which point he said, look, you really do have to come down and work for me. I said, yes, but my children are in school in the UK. My, my wife is here. We are, you know, we've got a life here in the UK. He said, that's all right. Why don't you fly down then? Um, you know, you come and consult for me um, on these issues. And so that's what I eventually ended up doing. So I ended up living in the UK while, you know, working in Malaysia. So I was commuting globally at that point. So it seems to me, I've, I've seen various documentaries and Najib giving interviews, and he seems to plead innocence and uh, ignorance, I think. And I think um, for me, anyway, I, 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 I find it very difficult to agree with him that when you are prime minister and at the same time, you've got positions of authority, and you have people telling you this stuff and you don't do anything about it. And you say, I didn't know, bro. I was never told. I think that's, that's quite disingenuous, lah, you know, Roman. And so I, I could it be a, I, I just, I just fear that maybe you are, you are, um, you know, laboring under the possibility of uh, suffering from Stockholm syndrome in the sense mm -hmm. that, <laughs> in the sense that you have been uh, become lenient and generous to your captivator. No, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I completely accept your point. I mean, you know, and Stockholm syndrome, maybe, I mean, you know, that, that could be it. But the reality of the situation is when I witnessed or what I witnessed, um, you know, in meetings and what have you, um, was very often individuals in these positions of power are given very little information. Um, so they, they make decisions based. Uh, you know, he had so much influence that he, he, he signed up on, on documents to the tune of billions. And how can you yeah. do that on the, on the back of, Partial information at, at best, right? And, you know, and that's a very, very good question. I mean, and I keep asking myself, you know, how would you actually sign off on these things? You know, make, make decisions based on that kind of information. But as I say, you know, very often the truth is stranger than fiction. Um, the, the reality of the situation was based on a very limited amount of information, decisions were made. Um, and, you know, if you ask me, look, should he have made better decisions? Should he have done better? Yes, of course. Um, you know, most definitely. But the reality of the situation was that all these individuals around him 
um, you know, when you're talking about his economic advisors, his his principal private secretary, all of these individuals were in the pocket of a certain individual. You know, they were on his payroll. Now, if you're on that, that person's payroll, the amount of information that's being fed to the center is obviously censored, right? I mean, yes. I mean, obviously, you know, you have to wonder, you know, you're getting all this good information, you're getting this, you know, all, all, all this positive information. So you should ask yourself, you know, is this true? You know, is this the reality? But, you know, having said that, on the 2nd of May um, 2018, you know, about what, seven, eight days before the election, before GE14, I told him that, look, you are going to lose the state of Johor. Our analytics indicated that he would lose the state of Johor. Um, I showed him the, the document and he said, look, uh, Roman, are you, are you sure this is accurate? Because everyone's telling me that we're going to win. We might even win by a, a, a three-quarter majority. You know, how accurate is, is this stuff? Do you even know what you're you know, implying? Do you even know what you're, you're, you're talking about? At which point, I was also wondering, look, is my stuff um, actually accurate? So when it even came down to GE14, if he was being fed this kind of information, you know, what more about anything else, you see? So this is why, uh, you know, you could say that, you know, I'm, I'm suffering from Stockholm. I'm viewing him um, in very rose-tinted glasses. But the reality of the situation was that very often it was very limited amounts of information that was being provided for decisions to be made. But then again, were the decisions right? I don't know. You know, and that's, that's left wide open. I'm not going to defend his decisions. I'm not going to defend... Uh, what he did, you know, because that was his decision as prime minister to make those choice. I mean, to, to, to decide on that, to sign off on those documents, to do all of that. Uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, far be it for me to, 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 to be able to, to comment or, or, or say anything on that. But from what I saw as a witness when I attended those meetings at the briefings, um, even at his house, um, very often, he had very limited amounts of information on which to make um, a, a decision. And, and a lot of the decisions, decisions today, you know, in hindsight, we look at him and we wonder, what the heck? Why did you decide? You know, why did you do that? Um, you know, and, and he rightly blamed for those decisions. You know, he's rightly blamed because as prime minister, you hold, you know, the buck stops with you. You hold uh, the ultimate power. You had to make that decision, you know, and now you've got, you've got to put up. Um, you know, with the consequences of those decisions. Well, you know, I mean, journalists uh, suffer from this occupational hazard, right? And it's uh, predominantly cynicism, isn't it, right? And because we see so much, we hear so much, we come across so many people, and let's just face it, some of them are the most insidious people on earth, right? And so we, we go around with this miasma of ne negativity and... Uh, you know, we've seen it all, all right? So I guess that must have informed you in some sense when you said, okay, like, enough of this place. Like, I'm going to go to the UK. At least there seems to be a rule of law. It seems, at least there seems to be some adherence to the constitution. At least there some, 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 at least you know what you're going to get. Do you know what I mean? And, and did that, did that, did the UK meet your expectations? Because I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm from here. I see that the UK is in a mess. The France is in a mess. Germany is in a mess. <laughs> is the UK, you know, what do what you think? You know, the grass is always greener, right? The grass always looks greener. So when I, when I was made that offer that, look, you know, come over here, you know, we want you to work for us. We want you to do uh, political risk consultancy and what have you. I thought, yeah, that's a great opportunity, right? Because I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, wh whatever the political dynamics are on the ground. I can say my views, my opinions without concern, without fear or favor, um, of, of the implications of my views because the views would be viewed frankly, um, you know, and that's what they, they, they would want to hear. Um, so I thought, yes, it's, it's great. It's a great opportunity to go there uh, to, to see something new. But the reality of the situation is very much like um, in Malaysia. It's not very much what you know, but very often who you know um, and, and how that, you know, how that influences individuals um, and even the, the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, in, in, in meeting individuals, um, you know, in, in working in the UK, I found just as many, just as many hurdles um, as, there were, as they are in Malaysia. I mean, yes, uh, in terms of a, a, a playing field, you can say that it might be a little bit more level. But, you know, I am... Well, is it really though? Is it really though? I mean... That's what I was just about to say. I mean, you know, I, 
uh, am not white. Um, in Malaysia, I'm not Malay. Um, you know, so wherever I am, I am a minority. I, I do not, uh, you know, benefit from the, the from being a, a member of the majority. And being a minority, wherever I am, um, effectively, I end up being second class. You know, I'm not I'm not first class. You know, the levels of racism, yes. You know, you feel that in Malaysia, you feel that here in the UK as well. Um, you know, it's just as bad uh, in terms of, um, you know, being called names, um, you know, in terms of being provided services and what have you. Um, and this happens on a, on, a, on a regular basis. So, you know, like I said, the grass always appears greener. Um, but is it necessarily uh, better when you get there? Not necessarily. Then don't forget, we had Brexit as well in the UK. So what ended up being, uh, you know, moderate cost of living has now skyrocketed for everyone. Um, and, 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 and this is a, a fundamental issue, right? What you were able to afford, now you can only afford 80% of that, you know, because prices have gone up by so much. Um, and then you have to think to yourself, oh gosh, is this, is this worthwhile? You know, is this worth, um, you know, carrying on here um, in the UK for? Um, you know, that's, that's a, it's, it's a very, very difficult, it's a very, very difficult question. I think in Malaysia, very often, you know, you are able to, you know, get along um, and, and, you know, things work out, you know, you can eat outside, you can do all kinds of things. Um, you are able to, you know, benefit um, from actually a network that you have. Um, and that's the difference here. I mean, in Malaysia, in Singapore, um, in Asia, you, I have a network. I have a network of friends in school. I have a network of friends at work and what have you. And this extends, you know, quite significantly. But here in the UK, it's pretty much, uh, you know, you by yourself. I mean, yes, you have a couple of friends, but you don't necessarily have the network that you built from, you know, when you were, what, seven, eight years old, um, all the way up. You know, that network doesn't exist. So, you know, you pick up the phone to call someone. I'm actually calling somebody in KL. I'm not calling somebody here in London. So that's the, you know, that's the, the, the reality of the situation, actually. Yeah, so in Malaysia, you've got, well, essentially racism, which is institutionalized and in some respect uh, consecrated in the constitution, right? So you know, you know where you stand. In the UK, which professes to be, you know, um, equitable and justice for all and, you know, level playing field, it's, it's unspoken, but it's very, very um, discriminatory, yeah, right? No, you're right. It's not just unspoken, but, you know, what's happened recently at Southport, um, the protests, the attacks against mosques, um, anyone who does not look, um, anyone who looks non-white, you know, attacking these individuals, the, the spreading of rumors uh, online, what's happened there is unacceptable. In fact, yesterday there were protests outside Number Ten Downing Street. They were throwing flares, um, attacking police. Um, police vehicles were burnt. Um, you know, and this is basically the in English Defence League. I mean, you know, very racist groups um, who are completely unhappy with immigrants, who are unhappy with those who are not white, um, and they attack individuals. And this is a, a clear and present threat. You don't see this in Malaysia. You don't have you know, people rioting against other races. I mean, the last time we had that was May 13th. Um, but here, this just happened yesterday, the day before yesterday, it happened here in the UK. So it's a clear and present threat to all those who are not necessarily white. So the level of racism is still very, very high, especially among these groups. That doesn't mean there aren't other groups who are fighting um, against racism but the level of racism is very high when you compare it to even a country like Malaysia. Yeah, I was reading in the UK, uh, in the Financial Times, something like uh, the average house price is like, it's like 25 times your median annual earnings. Uh, like something like a fifth, or one of every five Brits have depression or anxiety of some kind of like um, disorder. Um, the main issue is uh, the wealth divide. Um, and, and of course, dissent against the bankers, right, who basically raped the economy. And uh, that's why you've got Labour voted in by a huge margin, right? Um, I, I mean, there's I, the cost of heating in the in winter has gone through the roof four times or something, the, the price. I mean, do, Roman, do you regret moving to the UK? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a question I, 
you know, it's a question I keep asking myself every day. I mean, you know, gosh, is this the right decision? Is this, you know, is this the thing to do? Um, unfortunately, I'm, I am currently invested in the system in the sense that my kids are all at university. So I've got to wait until, you know, that, that process ends um, until I can make a, a decision on, on, on what I'm going to do. But it is a very, very costly affair. I mean, we're eating into our savings on a daily basis to, to, to pay for this. Uh, are you paying full price uh, for university? Um, for university, I, I, I'm lucky because the kids are residents. So as a result, they don't have to pay um, international um, fees because they're resident in, in, in the UK. So you, you get to pay local um, fees. But even local fees are still very expensive. And the issue is, and the issue is not fees. The issue is accommodation in the UK because although fees might appear moderate, the cost of rental, the cost of living in the UK is just so high, it's prohibitive. In fact, anyone who's coming in from Malaysia who, who sends their kids to the UK today, I mean, you know, gosh, they'll have to take a, sec, a first mortgage, second, a third mortgage in order to afford it because the cost is just, you know, it's becoming so prohibitive um, at this point in time. But don't get me wrong, the, the quality of education is great. I mean, you know, and obviously the cachet of having a UK degree is amazing. I mean, you know, that's what you want. But the price that you have to pay is becoming much higher than it used to be five, ten years ago. Um, you know, that's yeah. just the reality. That's just the reality. It's, it's, it, it, it is tough. But at a personal level, I mean, you know, b being on the vintage that we are, we've got to think about our futures as well. And are you able to put aside money for the futures in terms of how you think about retirement, um, having enough, you know, financial uh, liquidity, for example, you know, to fend off those 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 golden years as, and all the costs are rising? How, how do you think about that? Gosh, I mean, you know, that's something I think about on a regular basis. I mean, I'm already in my 50s, so, you know, it's not going to be too long more um, before retirement uh, beckons. Um, and if you ask me, am I going to retire here in the UK? I don't think so. I don't think so because the cost of living is so prohibitive. It's, it's just going to be it's just going to be too insane. I mean, we'll have to come up with some kind of a uh, some kind of a hybrid, uh, most probably, where you know we spend some time here, um, some time in Asia. Um, basically, um, if you ask me, retiring in Malaysia, Malaysia, my second home. That might be a, 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 a very good option. That might be a very, very good option because retirement here is a very difficult proposition because healthcare is also another major issue. Uh, making sure that you are taken care of in your golden years, that's a, a major problem that they have here in the UK. Um, healthcare or the care facilities are not necessarily the best. Um, you know, although you think, oh, it's a Western country, you know, the Western world, they've got, you know, state of the art um, care facilities. No, actually, if you ask me, the facilities in places like Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand are much better when it comes to taking care of the graying population than it is um, here in the UK. Um, the graying population here very often is, you know, forgotten. Um, they're not well taken care of. Um, it is much harder the government has now cut uh, the heating allowance given to some uh, of the elderly here in the UK. Before this, all in the UK would receive a certain amount of money for heating, basically to heat your house during the winter months. The current government has now cut that. Um, so a huge proportion, not a huge proportion, but a large proportion of, of, of elderly will now be affected by that. So what do you do in the winter if you need heating, but you don't have enough money to pay for the heating? Um, you know, that's a situation that you don't have to worry about in Malaysia because year round, you don't have to worry about heating. Air, condition, air conditioning is an, is an optional plus. You don't necessarily need air conditioning. But here in the UK, you need heating in the winter. So how do you afford that? As an elderly person, you know, these are the choices that you're going to have to make. Is it heating or is it food? Um, you know, what am I going to use my money on? And that's a, a really difficult choice. So for someone like me, uh, you know, I don't want to have to make that kind of a choice. I don't want my, my wife, my kids to have to make that kind of a choice. So I would like to make that choice on my behalf. You know, um, two-part question, Roman. What is life like as an Indian, kind of like uh, Asian in the UK? And secondly, for those people who are thinking, oh my God, Malaysia's in a mess. Oh my God, Asia, or oh, oh, I want to go live in the UK because I think it's better there. You know, um, masale and all that. No, honestly, right? Because there's, there's this idea among Malaysians that, oh, you know, 
I'm going to be a better taken care of. Like, you know, what have you got to say to them? I think, you know, basically those who think it's a better life here, what have you. Yes, if you've got lots of money, it might be a fantastic life here. But if you don't have lots of money, honestly, quality of life, uh, the food, the culture, all of that's so much better in a place like Malaysia. Because the, at the end of the day, you know, all of us, we grew up, where did we grow up? We grew up in the kampongs, in the neighborhoods, in the suburbs, in places like Kuala Lumpur or, you know, Ipoh, wherever. You know, and that is the culture we've become accustomed to. That is something that we're used to. You come over here to the UK, it is completely different, right? Because you think, yes, oh, it's brand new, so it's great, it'll be wonderful. But then if you want your laksa, if you want your kway tiao, can you get it? Yes, you can, but you're going to have to pay a huge amount for it. Can you chat to somebody the way you'd speak to somebody on the streets? Can you, you know, lapa? No, you can't. You can't lapa. I mean, you know, you're speaking to somebody in a different culture. So it's adapting to that culture, it's learning the rules of that culture, and then living that culture, as opposed to a culture that you were brought up in. You know, a culture that you understand, you know, that's at your fingertips. You know what you need to do to get things done as opposed to the UK where you don't know what needs to be done in order to get things done. You know, all of it is just completely foreign um, and you're, you're learning, you're, you're trying to find your way. Oh, you know, maybe I need to do this, maybe I need to do that. I don't know, you know, and maybe I succeed, maybe I don't succeed. But you will always, you know, I find, find feel as if you're an outsider. You'll never feel as if you're part of the system, part of the community. And that's very unlike Malaysia, where the moment I land at KLIA, I feel like I'm back home. I feel like, yeah, you know, this is it. I know what's going on. I know the system. I know what's happening. Um, I know the individuals. The individual people know me. Um, you know, it is just so comfortable, right? That level of comfort you don't have um, over here. And, and as I get older, I find that that's much more important to me. You know, yes, having freedoms, having, uh, you know, the open space, uh, you know, the, the four seasons, all of that's wonderful. Uh, but the reality is, you know, sometimes I just want to sit down and lap out with someone. Can I do that um, in the UK? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I remember one of my best friends, um, when he met a British girl, he went over there. And this is what a fellow that, you know, I think he's up here. only left from uh, Malaysia once. I think he went to India once and that was it, right? So he goes to the UK for the first time, like 15 years ago, right? He said to his friend when he woke up on his couch, and he said, hey, hey you know, hey, Sunil, come, 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 let's go for roti chanai. So it's 7.30 in the morning. But well, Sunil said, hey, bro, here got no roti chanai. <laughs> <laughs> so, so cute, lah, right? But you know what I mean, right? It's like, no, there ain't such a thing, man. You might get a pastry shop open at 8.30, but that's it, right? Eating a sausage roll and having a roti chanai are not the same things. Honestly, they're not the same thing. It's because having a roti chanai, drinking your teh tare and having your curry ayam or what have you brings with it so many different connotations, feelings, um, you know, and a level of comfort that you don't necessarily feel having a cup of coffee and a croissant. Um, and, and, and that's the reality of the situation. So, you know, we are built in that system. We have come up with the culture of that system. So that system is effectively within us. Um, so when you come here, it's great, it's nice, uh, you know, you, you, you get used to it, but does that feel like home necessarily? Does it feel like, you know, like, like you are part of it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, you know, and I, I've been in the UK now for about what, more than 10 years. You know, we've moved for, to the UK for more than 10 years and I still do not feel as if I'm one, uh, you know, I, I'm part of the, the system, part of the, of the community as it were. Because there is also this level of coldness uh, and officiousness. So even within your family itself, uh, you know, people don't invite anyone to their houses. Unlike in KL, you know, where they you know, say, oh, come over to my place at KL Central or, you know, come over, you know, we'll, we'll do this, you know, we'll hang out. Um, in the UK, you meet outside. You don't go to people's houses very often. Um, and if you do, it's a very, very special occasion. Um, you know, so hanging out is very, very different. Um, whereas, you know, in, in Malaysia, you know, you'd hang out at whoever's house, you know, whoever's having a party or, you know, just cup, come over for a cup of coffee, drinks or, um, or, or what have you. That's a, a very, very different situation. It's very different um, here in the UK. Yeah, I'd have to say though, Roman, uh, Malaysia's not as open house as it used to be, you know. 
<laughs> it, it, it still happens, but it's not as it's become a bit siloed. You know what I mean in, in recent years, and that's unfortunate. So I, I guess you still look at political risk, and you still look at the you know the geopolitics of everything, right? Um, yeah. Sitting as you do in the UK, um, what do the Brits feel about what's happening in the Ukraine? Um, where are alignments with the US now? Uh, what's the fear factor? How how do you read the temperature? I mean, what's what's happening next? I mean, what's your sense? Well, I think it's very difficult for the UK because obviously they believe in the special relationship with the US. And for yeah. a long time, that has worked. And it has worked when prime ministers of the UK are able to work closely with the presidents of the US. The, the issue now is that we are, you know, come November, it's very likely that we're going to see a Trump White House. And the question is whether he is going to be willing to work on this special relationship with Keir Starmer, the, the, the new British Prime Minister. And the reason I say that is because the fear in the UK and in Europe is that when a Trump White House does happen, he will be looking very quickly to have a resolution in, in the Ukraine, which would mean handing over territory uh, to the Russians, basically, in order to get a peace deal um, and to sort the situation. That is not necessarily in the best interest of the UK or the other countries in, in Europe. And that is fundamentally the fear that they have of a Trump White House come November. So when it comes to the relationship, they're really, really worried. I mean, you know, are they more supportive of Kamala Harris? Yes, they are, because they know what the Democrats are going to do. They know the Democrats are not going to do a deal with, with Putin. But the fear is that Trump is willing to do the deal because he is, after all, the man, the art of the deal. I mean, you know, he loves deals. Um, and, and the fear is that he's going to do a deal um, regardless of what his NATO allies um, think of the deal. Um, and they're going to have to just suck it up uh, and, and accept it. The question then is, will there remain, will there be still a special relationship between the US um, and the UK? Um, because obviously the, the UK needs the US more than the US needs the UK at this point in time. So, you know, the power imbalance is there. And, and it, it's always, you know, they always appear to try and show that there isn't that imbalance that, you know, oh, we are equal partners, you know, we, we, we work closely with one another because of this special relationship. But the reality of the situation is the UK does need the UK, US more um, than the US needs the UK. Um, so, so this is, it's, it's, it's a big fear coming up to November. It's a, it's a, it's a huge fear. Yeah, but ironically, if you follow the path of the Democrats, yeah, they could be in, I mean, that could well mean an extension of the war, if not an escalation. So, I mean, that's the wider concern, right? Don't you think? Well, the, the, the issue is the buildup in Russia as well. I mean, because Russia is building up its troops. I mean, you know, although they might, you might not see a massive offensive, they are building it up. And the fear in the UK, the fear in Europe is that basically Russia would be able to carry out a prolonged war beyond the Ukraine. Uh, what happens if they decide that they want more um, than the Ukraine? What happens to Europe? What happens um, uh, you know, in this part of the world? That is another you know, fear, uh, you know, currently existential, but you know, it could very easily turn into a, a, a reality um, for people here in the UK. They, they believe that the current White House um, basically wants Putin to answer for what he's done. They're not, the current White House is not willing to necessarily do a deal based on what Putin wants, but, may, but more a negotiated settlement um, you know, in, in the current scenario, as opposed to a Trump White House that unfortunately, from what's being said so far, uh, you know, it appears that he would be willing to do, you know, a, a quick deal, whatever the deal took, he'd be able to, he'd be willing to, to, to do that. So I think Europe and the UK are not necessarily looking for a quick deal, but they're looking for something that would be acceptable to the Ukraine, um, to the UK, um, you know, and, and Europe as, as a whole in terms of managing the, the, the security um, of the region, I would say. And then, and then the rest of the continent, I think France seems to be getting more nationalistic, uh, quite clearly, uh, Germany equivalently so, uh, and it's in, in, in other parts of, of Europe as well, especially in, in the northern, uh, wealthier northern western parts of Europe. What's your, I guess, uh, headline summation of what that means for the conflicts? And I think especially for the rest of the world, uh, you know, should we be concerned about how things are developing? 
I think in the UK and um, in Europe, I mean, there is there is quite a lot of concern, basically, of how right leaning um, you know countries have become. I mean, you look at Hungary, you look at France, you look at Germany, you look at the various elections, um, and how there is now more an anti immigrant attitude, uh, you know, a much more right wing uh, attitude that's coming across. Um, and if Trump wins, you're going to see that pretty much in the US as well. Um, you know, and how that's moving more um, towards the right. I mean, in Malaysia, we keep talking about the green wave, you know, and, and you know, what's going to happen, you know, with greater Islamization and what have you. Um, here, you're looking at, you know, basically a greater level of, of right-wing racism, um, you know, bearing its head. I mean, you know, the, the inability to deal with greater inclusivity, um, the, the willingness to, you know, to, to basically rush, ride roughshod uh, on the rights of your minorities. That is going to be a, a, a very big issue. Um, given the way immigration has, has taken place, um, the boatloads of people that have come over to the UK, um, the way they've come across Europe, um, and how that, that, that has affected European countries. Um, you know, we see this as, uh, as you know, something that's inevitable. Uh, you know, this is going to happen, but how far you know, is it going to get? We don't know. Uh, you know, the fear is that these governments are going to become extremely right wing. Um, and what happens then? What happens to, to, to all these refugees, uh, to these immigrants? We don't know. We don't know. Um, but what that means is that these countries will no longer be as inclusive um, as what they once were. Uh, they will not be welcoming um, anymore. The immigration policies are going to be much, much tough, tougher. Um, we are lucky here in the UK because the Labour government is unlikely to implement these policies they are left as opposed to you know right right wing in the in the attitude so it's unlikely to we are unlikely to see that in the UK but we don't know about the rest of Europe you see so the UK could be a standalone uh, in a sea of 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 right wing countries um over the next couple of months so if you were to be advising the Anwar government or the next prime minister as it were right and trying to i guess issue advice or guidance in terms of how to position Malaysia in the context of this world. Um, and of course, you know, in the context of wider ASEAN as well, you know, what would be the headline bullet points? I think, you know, I think fundamentally we need to move away from the, the issue of Malay hegemony. I mean, uh, that should, has to stop underpinning our foreign policy. You know, it is not an issue of the supremacy um, it is an issue of how m multicultural country like Malaysia can make a difference on the international stage. You know that's how Malaysia needs to look at itself, uh, and in terms of its if it's of its foreign policy itself, in terms of engaging with countries, we now have a coherent government that's representative of the Malays, that's representative of the non-Malays. You have all this goodwill. You need to make use of that to show how inclusivity actually is a success factor for countries like Malaysia, for countries in Southeast Asia, um, and how they're able to use that to punch above their weight. Um, you know, countries in, in Europe, uh, the US for that matter, they want Malaysia to take specific route. They want you to either, you know, give complete support for the US and that's what it is now. It's either complete support for the US or complete support for China. But Malaysia does not have to make such a choice. Malaysia can take the non-aligned path. Malaysia can take a path where we believe that everybody has a right to exist, where we believe we have a system um, that provides everyone with adequate uh, representation. We don't have to take the American side. We don't have to take the Chinese side in any of these issues. And this, you know, fundamentally comes to, you know, play when it comes to the issue of the South China Sea. Um, you know, Malaysia has to take its own independent route. It does not necessarily have to ally itself with any of the, of the great powers. Um, and, 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 you know, having said that, we also don't have to ally ourselves with the ideology of the Maghrebi nations. Um, yes. It is very important to understand the Palestinian cause. It is very important to support the Palestinian cause. But Malaysia is not Palestine either. Malaysia sets its own agenda, its own policies um, in this world. What you say, Roman, necessitates uh, leadership 
in its correct definition. Leaders, statespeople, uh, statesmen, stateswoman, if not, uh, it requires someone or a team with a global point of view and who can uh, interact with the world at large and also interact with the domestic forces. What we don't have right now are people of that ilk. I mean, we have a leadership vacuum in Malaysia. We've got a leadership vacuum in many parts of the world, um, Robin. So so that that is the reality, you know. And Malaysia yeah. seems to be... It seems to be fighting these internal fires, these internal battles in their mind without a very clear consciousness about what's happening in the world around them. Malaysia could so easily become a leader and punch above its weight, but it does not because it doesn't have that leadership. Well, I, you know, I think fundamentally that is the reality of the situation, right? I mean, if you are going to use hegemony as a basis of platform of your policy of deciding who gets promoted, who gets into key positions, this is the problem that you're going to have. Greater inclusivity means you have a greater variety of ideas, opinions, views, perceptions on how to address issues. Um, and that is the only way, if you ask me, for Malaysia to succeed. If you have a multiplicity of views, of opinions, you need the various races to all contribute. It is not just one particular race. It is everyone contributing to creating this, this, this country that we have. Yeah. Sorry, teacher. That's not politically feasible. Huh? <laughs> you know that, right? I mean, that's the problem, you see. Like, look, in, in, India is already the most populous country in the world. There's a fast emerging economy. It's going to be a force to be reckoned with. We had this guy, not even 40 years old in America, Vivek Ramaswamy, running for president. Hello. And what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Mate, what are we doing here? You, well, you know, well, well, that's the reality of the situation, right? I mean, the and running for president in America, I know I didn't mention America. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> hello, <laughs> what? Do you know what I mean, right? The real, well, but you see, the thing is, right? We, we, we have basically, um, you know, um, um, handicapped ourselves, right? I mean, you know, you've got the leadership, you've got individuals at second, third, you know, levels of, of you got smart girls, smart guys, right? You need to promote them, right? You need, you need to promote these people. You need to put them in. You need to put them in. I mean, don't tell me in in Wisma Putra you do not have third, fourth, fifth level individuals who can be promoted up the ranks. Um, you know, if you're not, if you stop looking necessarily at specific special rights, special privileges, if you're looking specifically on merit, there are many individuals who can be promoted up the rank who can do a very, very good job, you know, and, and, and this is what, because we have, you know, and, and that's the problem, right? Very often we say, oh, we don't have the people. No, I disagree. We have the people. It's just that we haven't put these people in the right positions. We are not willing to give them the opportunities to prove themselves to make a difference for Malaysia. We used to do that. We had the ability to do that. We've lost that ability. We need to start that again. You've got a unity government now. This is what the unity government should be looking at. They should be looking at how to bring these individuals, bring in this kind of inclusivity. You know, stop the narrow-mindedness. Stop the look, looking at only special privileges or special rights. Start bringing in people that can make a difference in this country. Because once you do that, once the economy starts improving, once people see that you have a vision for this country, you know, you, you, are, you know what you are doing, you will have the support, you will have the political stability. But if you're not willing to bring in the people, and by bringing in the people, I mean non-Malays, I mean Malays, I mean everyone, East Malaysia, I'm talking about all these individuals who can contribute. Once you start bringing in these people, you will make a change. Is it easy? No. Can it be done overnight? No. You know, is it practical? Yes, it is practical, as long as they're willing to stick their necks out and do it. Right, you've got a government now that has got the Malays, you've got the non Malays, you've got the stabilities. Make the tough decisions, make the tough calls. You've done it now with social media, you've made the call. People can call it dictatorial, you know, it's up to them to call it whatever they want. But you've got the mandate to do it, make the tough calls now. Everyone will thank you five years from now. Well, political will, we know where Malaysia stands on that, right? What is easier, though, or less difficult, maybe, is how you advise your kids. Because you told me your kids are in university, right? How do you, how'd you talk to them? What, what kind of, like, um, how do you inform them? What, what are your guidance principles? Well, you know, when I, when I talk to my kids, it's very, very simple. I mean, you know, I tell them that where you have to come from 
is you have to come from a position of understanding. So you have to understand the different systems that you operate in. And I'm very lucky because, you know, my wife uh, is, is, um, is, is Caucasian. Um, I am Indian. So my children obviously come from a mixed um, heritage, as it were. So they understand uh, my wife's um, heritage. They understand my um, um, uh, heritage. So there is a, there is a mixture of, um, of, of both of these cultures, um, as it were. So they see how I function, how I operate, how I talk to people, how I engage. They see how my wife does the exact same thing. And they see how both of us, you know, although we come from completely different cultures and different worlds, are able to, you know, work together, integrate and, and remain inclusive. So I think for them, that's actually a, a, a pretty fundamental role model. Um, where they see that race really doesn't make very much of a difference, right? It's your capability, uh, it's your ability, it's you know, it's what you have up there, it's how you use it. You know, that becomes a fundamental role for them. So very often they don't look at race as the defining factor. They look at credibility uh, of a person. They look at the the, the merit uh, of a person's argument, the ability to prove uh, themselves. That's more substantive. Uh, than, 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 than just this, you know. Well, Roman, so far I've only ever seen you on a screen, uh, on YouTube, <laughs> on other podcasts, and, and then now via, via Zoom. So I think, I suspect, um, we will be having discussions down the line, uh, but I'd like to thank you now for, for what you've given me and your time and your advice and your principles. Fantastic. Uh, good luck in the UK. Um, I hope to catch up with you in Malaysia soon. And uh, okay. maybe the next time we discuss, you know, affairs, it will be a different world. I, I hope so. I hope so. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, mate. Take care. Cheers. Cheers, bye.